Warren Stevens, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to sit down and visit. It's been a while and it's good to catch up with you. Well, it's good to catch up with you too, Robbie. Thank you. Talk about This Is Capitalism, this new effort that you are putting forth to push and promote the idea of capitalism. Uh, you think that few ideas and institutions are as misunderstood as capitalism is today, is what you've said in doing this. Why do you think that is? Well, uh, uh, it's, it's obvious, really. I mean, all you had to do is look at the appeal that Bernie Sanders had in the last election, and he carried 22 states in the Democratic primary. And he's a socialist, and he's, he's espousing policies that are, that are socialistic. And it resonated with a lot of young people, and, I, and it just dawned on me that they don't, even, they don't even understand what capitalism is, and they probably don't understand what socialism is either. I mean, you and I are old enough to have witnessed failed socialist communist regi regimes, you know, go down by the dozen, and dozens really, and um, I, just, I just think there's, there's not a full understanding of what capitalism allows people and everyday people to benefit from and conduct their lives. So that's why we launched this series, This is Capitalism. We, I know uh, free enterprise polls better than capitalism does, uh, but we, we said, no, we're going to take on, we're going to take it on. We're going to say this is capitalism because that's really, you know, that's really what it is. You, uh, you have described that uh, you think capitalism is agnostic in that anybody can benefit from it. It is not exclusive or special to anyone in particular. It, that's what's missing with this younger generation, you think, is that they don't understand how it can benefit them. That's exactly right, and I don't think they understand. I mean, take our firm, for example. I mean, here we are, a significant financial services firm started by my uncle in 1933 who had a sixth or an eighth grade education. We're not really sure about that. He, he used to change the story a little <laughs> bit every now and then. But, um, you, you know, only in a country and in a system like the United States and in a system that embraces capitalism could, could he have even done that. And so we're going to, we're going to, we've produced, we've released two videos on the website. We have four more that are done. And we're going to do, we're going to continue to do these videos and tell the story of ordinary U.S. citizens who have not only bettered themselves, but they've, they've bettered all the people that worked with them, their communities. Uh, you know, that's, that's what people are missing in, in capitalism. Somehow capitalism is a greedy, you know, zero-sum game that, that people... Uh, who have an in can do well and people who don't cannot. Really nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. Now I, I freely admit as, as government and business seem, seems to have gotten closer over the years, there, you know, the phrase crony capitalism does have, does have uh, some significance in real meaning, but that's not what we're talking about. We're, 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 a hundred percent opposed to that crony capitalism, and a hundred percent supportive of capitalism. Let's let's see where the ideas go and and how people do. And uh, I think another thing that's probably driving that wedge, particularly with millennials and a younger generation, is you see the statistics about how the top one percent or two percent seem to accumulate more and more wealth. Yeah. Why do you think it hasn't trickled down or fallen down or been more widespread? in terms of that consolidation of, of wealth? Well, first of all, I think the way we count the top 1% share of, of the income in this country changed substantially in the mid, from the mid-80s to today because everyone who had a company converted to a subchapter S or an LLC and all of a sudden that income, which was their company's income, uh, and net income accrued to them. So we've, ch we've changed the way we account for income uh, and, and it's, a, it's a good thing, but I think when you look at all, all the quintiles of income distribution in this country, everyone has risen over a significant period of time. I know we've had incomes flatten out here lately for, for people in the middle class, and that's a problem. But it, you're not going to 
you're not going to solve it by somehow taking away money from one per, the top 1% and distributing, distributing it to the rest because there isn't enough to go around. And it doesn't solve the problem of education of almost this teach a person to fish mentality versus yeah. giving them a fish. It doesn't solve that dilemma. Yeah, I mean, it, a lot goes into it, of course, um, and, and our education system is, is uh, falling short in a, lot of, in a lot of areas, but it's still, you know, it's, it's still a system where people, bright people, regardless of their education, can do well and, and succeed. And, the, and there's, you know, the, the good news about this series from us, This Is Capitalism, is there's an endless supply of those stories. I mean, they're just, I mean, they're everywhere. And, and, uh, and, and I don't think a lot of people realize it. Of course, you know, uh, Bill Gates never finished college. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg never finished college. Um, they've done pretty well, you know? <laughs> so the education system isn't, isn't the end all to, to, to this. Uh, you, can, you can do pretty well. My uncle, you know, never finished Whatever, eighth sixth grade. Or eighth grade See, a sixth or eighth grade, whichever, whichever one suited him the day he was telling the story. But it is true. I mean, he never got, he never got past the eighth grade. So sixth or eighth grade doesn't really make any difference. Let's shift gears and talk about some things happening in current uh, okay. market conditions here. Yep. I want to talk about some risks that we see out there eventually, but let's talk about some fun stuff and positive stuff okay. first. Where does Warren Stevens see opportunity right now? What are some, uh, is there an industry sector or some things that are percolating out there that you think are areas to kind of keep an eye on in terms of really igniting some economic development and uh, some entrepreneurism? Well, I, I, I think um, we, we really need regulatory reform, uh, particularly in the banking sector. Uh, it wouldn't hurt in our securities industry either. Um, but if we can get some relief in those areas, I think you will see a good bit of lending take place that's not taking place now. Um, we, we see it a lot that people just are very cautious. They know they can't, they don't have great access to capital. Um, it's, it's fairly limited and, and uh, frankly the bank's hands are tied on a lot of, on a lot of things. So if we, could, if, we, if we can get some relief in that area, I, I think you can see the general economy grow. I don't, I don't really have a specific you know, sector in mind. I, I, I do think um, you know, what's going on in, in the energy sector in the U.S is pretty darn remarkable. Yeah. And has been for several years. Has been for several years. I think it's going to I think it's going to continue. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean good things are going to happen to oil stocks because it may depress oil oil and gas prices because they're so successful at at drilling and finding reserves and producing it. So but it is it is again just a only in a capitalistic system where, frankly, where individuals own the minerals, um, would you have such a, re such a revolution as what, they, what we refer to, what the industry refers to as the shale revolution that's going on in the, in the industry sector? I mean, you know, French banned uh, fracking in the Paris Basin, which all my friends in the energy energy business say is perfectly suited for fracking and could really benefit from it. Well, if they if you tried to do that in Midland, Texas, and all those ranchers owned the minerals underneath, you'd have a riot on your hands, rightfully <laughs> so. Right. But the individuals don't own it. You know, the state owns the minerals, and so they can do whatever they want. But all it's doing is costing French consumers uh, more in energy costs. That's, that's, again, that's just not the way things ought to work. With the Republican president and Republican majorities in both houses of Congress, have you been surprised there hasn't been a quicker rollback of some of these regulations that you're talking about, particularly with Dodd-Frank, which yeah. left a lot of ability to the regulators to, yeah. to un unwind or wind up? Yeah, a little bit. Um, you know, the, I think every, I've, 
certainly known this for a while, but you know, the Republican Party is itself pretty split. And you have, you know, people that are in, in the House of Representatives or in the Freedom Caucus. Well, you know, the Freedom Caucus representatives have very little in common with our Arkansas congressional de our House delegation. And the Tuesday group, which is more moderate. Right, and the Tuesday group. So, you know, I, I, and I also think, um, so I think that slowed it down. And I also think that, um, you know, the administration has, the Trump administration's gotten off to a very slow start, and I think they're not uh, well organized. And, um, you know, they're not, they need, you know, they needed, I congratulate them on getting health care back on track through the House, but now, you know, it goes to the Senate and there's going to be a whole new bill, that, you know, it's going to be a completely we'll be starting new over, right? Yeah, right. We're starting over on that. And, you know, the legislative, the legislative um, process just takes time. But I, th I think, I certainly think the Trump administration could be doing a better job of keeping things focused on health care and tax reform and Dodd-Frank. And, and I think they're doing some things with executive order where they can, but you know, executive orders can be reversed by the next president. So they need to, you know, they need to do that where they can, but they also need to address it legislatively. Tax reform is gonna be a big federal issue, obviously. Yep. Do you have some things that you think are imperative that needs to get done by Congress in terms of tax reform, there are one or two things that you just think are uh, essential? Well, um, I, th I think the, the tax rate on capital gains really, really needs to come down. Um, it, is, it is a historically proven fact. If you lower capital gains rates, the revenue goes up. And that the same is not true on income taxes, by the way, but I do think income taxes ought to, ought, to, ought to come down. I mean, when you, right now, when you see what people in the top 1% are paying of the federal tax receipts, it's far more than their share of the one, that the 1% gets of, of income. I mean, there are, you know, people say, well, we want to tax or top 1%, uh, well, you're already doing it because the top 10% pay virtually all the income taxes in this country. Um, I'm not saying that's fair or unfair, but to a middle income or a low income earner, that's a hard argument for them to feel sympathy for, don't you think? Well, no, my, I, I, I'm not saying they ought to pay more taxes, but the, the real problem is the, the government consumes too much money. And either we're going to address that. There is a, if you if you confiscated all the top ten percent income, you don't you don't fix the the budget shortfall. So, you know, we got structural issues here in spending that need to be that need to be addressed. And 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 you know what is what is the right amount of taxes for someone to pay? I mean. Age-old question, right? I mean, what's the what's the age-old question? I mean, I, I would say it's it's less than fifty percent, which is right about where we are currently, um, for anybody. You know, if we why you know and why why do I pay fifty percent in income taxes when you know we're here trying to invest in a business and create jobs and grow this firm? Why why would we? Why, why do you think? Well, I'm not saying you particularly, <laughs> but why do people think that that's, that's fair? Um, would 90% be okay? You know, if I paid 90% to the people who, who say that's not fair, you know, that you ought to pay more, would, would that be the right number? Uh, but like I say, you, you're not, until you address the spending, you're not going to fix, you're not going to fix the budget. And, and you know, people that, people that want free tuition or free health care or, it, you know, there is no such thing. Somebody's going to pay for it. Are you keeping an eye on what's going on at the state level with tax reform? There's basically a top to bottom review of yeah. that. I think they'll spend several months before we'll see any recommendations come out. Yeah, I, I think, 
I, I'm not well versed on exactly what they're looking at, but you know, we, we sit between two states that have zero income tax. And I know you get to make it up in other areas, but it's much more discretionary in terms of property taxes and sales taxes. Um, and for businesses to be attracted to Arkansas, we've got to have a more competitive rate because you can stop in Tennessee or you can skip over us and go to Texas and pay zero. You don't even get off, you know, you don't even, you don't even get to first base with a lot of companies that are looking, looking to relocate. And I'd, I'd like to see us be more competitive in that area. And I think, you know, it started under Governor Beebe. He's been, he's, he started reducing income taxes where he could. Um, and I know Governor Hutchinson is, is, is doing the same, and I hope, I hope that'll continue. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. I appreciate it. Thanks, Raymond. Good.